so you wrote this script a long time ago. And after watching the movie, I'm like, do you have a lot of scripts like this just sitting around waiting that you can just jump back in time, you know, and grab? Uh, the ones that came before it in A Perfect World, there are probably five or six scripts I wrote. And I, I, I don't think I would want to make them. And I don't think anybody else would either. So. Got it. It was you cutting your teeth. Yeah. I mean, I wrote this right after A Perfect World. Um, and I don't know, it just all kind of was, it was locking in for me a little bit as a writer at that point. And that's not to say that, you know, movies always get made because most of them don't. Um, but uh, yeah, you yeah, know, only, only took 28 years, so. <laughs> yeah, what I find fascinating, and I could be wrong about this, is weren't other people like Clint Eastwood and Steven Spielberg, like at one point attached to direct this script? Yeah, it, it, how, it, how it came about was uh, I had a blind, Steven Spielberg really liked the script for Perfect World. And um, so he came to me and said, let's, let's find something to do together. So he came up with a blind picture deal with Warner Brothers for me to write something for Steven to direct. And we pitched stuff back and forth a little bit. And then I came up with this idea for the little things and wrote a really long outline and talked to him on the phone about it, what I wanted to do. And he said, I really like it. It, it's just too dark for me right now because he was doing Schindler's List. And, um, and I, you know, it's, it's easily understandable. Um, and so the next person for a minute was Clint Eastwood that I had a relationship with. And uh, then he went off to do something else. After that, it was Warren Beatty. And I spent a decent amount of time with Warren going to have lunches and talking about the script and him kind of feeling his way through it. And that never quite happened. Danny DeVito, back when he was directing, was attached, and it almost seemed like it was going to happen, but didn't. Uh, Dean Pariso was very interested in it. Um, and then somewhere along the way, I started directing, uh, you know, in The Rookie in 2000. And Mark Johnson, the producer, asked me, uh, you know, every couple of years, what about the little things? Because it was a script that people really, really yeah, enjoyed. And there would be other directors that would call about it. And I, I thought, well, yeah, if you can get it made, make it with him, Mark. Um, and I had a little, I, I turned it down because I had little kids and uh, I thought that was a dark place to live in for two years, which is, you know, what you spend on a movie directing. Um, then my kids went off to college and there was these things at all. There was a confluence of Mark saying, I think you should really, really open it and read it again. Cause I just did. And I really like it. I think it's time for it to be made. And then two friends of mine, uh, Scott Frank and Brian Helgeland, um, who were both big fans of the script, had reached out to me within three months of each other and emailed and said, you need to do the little things. I think Scott said, you're an idiot if you don't do the little things, you know, being a good friend. Um, and so I thought, well, all this pushing tells me I need to read it again. And I read it and I was terrified to read it because I thought I'm going to see, um, you know, some bad writing maybe. Um, and... And I actually really, really liked it. So, I mean, I, I changed a few things, um, but it's 90% of what I wrote in 1992, 93. When you cast people like this, are you sort of like tweaking the script based on their notes and their ideas? And how much is it sort of like, Denzel, I love you. You're a brilliant actor, but I really want to make this script. Well, I think you want to make the script in macro. I'm, I'm a director that I would say that probably... 20% of the dialogue I really am specific about. Like this phrase turns this way on the page and I'd love it to be this way. Um, the other 80% is usually something that's, does, is it clear? Does it move the story? Does it fit better with the character than what I wrote? You have to be malleable with it. I do at least. I mean, you know, I know that, you know, the Aaron Sorkin is very, very, very specific. For me, I'm, I'm more interested in behavior and naturalism and then making it their own so that everybody sounds different. You know, when they sign on for a script, they're signing on for the, you know, the full and complete package. And you do spend a lot of time. I spend a lot of time with Denzel um, and well, all actually all three of them um, talking about scenes, not so much rehearsal. It's just about I mean, Denzel's, you know, always says the uh, the universal comes from the specific. And so the tiniest little details that you could talk talk about. What kind of music does he listen to? What does he usually eat for breakfast? Um, what kind of coat would he wear in this scene? The more of that you can get out of the way, by the time you get to the actual production, you, we, we all know exactly what we need and how to accomplish this. And, and then it's just getting out of the way and letting these three you know, brilliant actors do their thing. Uh, how tough was it to get uh, this movie greenlit 
because it doesn't have superheroes in it. To be completely honest, I was really surprised that Warner Brothers, who owned it from 1992, you know, what, what happened was I had done a movie, The Highwayman, for Netflix, and they wanted to do another, they wanted to do another movie. And I had read the little things and thought I want to do this. So the thought was, Mark Johnson and I said, let's see if we can get it out of Warner Brothers, because I don't think they'll make it. I mean, it's an adult drama in a mid-range budget. Um, studios are really reluctant to do that these days. And so, you know, talk to Courtney Valenti inside Warner Brothers as a friend, longtime friend, who was the only person at Warner Brothers that had read the script back when I wrote it. Um, nobody, nobody was there. It's all newer people. So um, I, you know, went to Courtney and said, I'd love to try to get it out. And she goes, well, no promises, but I'll see what I can do. But everybody has to read it first. <laughs> I said, that makes sense. She goes, we have to know what we're giving away. And I said, no, of course. Okay, great. She calls me back two weeks later and said, I've got good news and bad news. And it's the same news. Everybody loves the script, which means, doesn't mean we're going to, you know, make it. It just means we're probably not going to let it go. Um, and then, you know, the, they ask again, they go, what are the underlying rights? And I said, there are none. It was a story I made up. Um, you know, and way back then, they didn't pay me a ton of money to write it either. So there was not much money against the script. Um, but, you know, then they, they surprised me. They came in and they said, physical production people came in and said, um, we, we came up with a, we're going to apply for the California rebate for film just because the deadline's coming up in a couple of days and why not, right? Um, but we have to put a, a budget and a schedule together. So I went through a day out of days with them and said, yeah, this feels like it's in the ballpark. You know, this feels about what I think it should be. Um, and they submitted it. And I thought, well, they'll see if they get that or not. And then I got a call and said, who would you like to play Joe Deacon in, the, in your own perfect world? And so Mark Johnson, the producer, and I talked about it for about half a second and said Denzel Washington. And uh, I knew Denzel because I had done some production rewrites on Safe House and Magnificent Seven. And we'd spent time in South Africa, in Cape Town, South Africa together in a room talking about story. Um, you know, so we got to know each other and we're able to look each other in the eyes and, and come to some kind of, you know, a, a story trust, if you will. And we liked one another. And so we sent it to Denzel and he read it and said, let's sit down and talk. And we did. And at the end of like an hour and a half meeting, um, you know, we shook hands and said, let's, let's do this thing. And so all of a sudden it was like, wow, this is actually going to happen, I believe, after, after 28 years, you know, and it all happened quickly after that. I mean... Rami coming on board and then Jared coming on board. Well, I was going to say, once Denzel comes on a picture, doesn't that pretty much mean a green light at this point with his star power? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was going to say, uh, one of the things that I enjoy about this movie is that it is a twist on what people have seen before. It is not walking in the same path, you right. know? Um, and sort of talk a little bit about that, that this is not the cop movie you've seen. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of crime drama and psychological thrillers and all those things. But I kind of remember thinking back then in the early nineties that they had become a bit by rote or paint by numbers in that you would have a first act uh, that was interesting and clues coming at you that you had to decipher and misdirections. And so you've you know got all that happening in the first two acts and it's always really interesting and intriguing. And then there were so many of them that just fell apart in the third act for me because the bad guy would be identified and the good guy would chase the bad guy. And there was usually some, you know, ridiculous action set piece or something. And then the, the, you know, the good guy would kill the bad guy in some morbid but heroic fashion. And, and that interested me the least of the you know, three parts of a, of a three act movie. And I thought, is there a way to embrace the genre and subvert, but subvert the genre so that the third act is not formulaic, but it's still satisfying and it's satisfying in a different way. And so that was the challenge. And I thought that's, that's, worth, that's worth trying to do. Yeah, one of the things I also like about the script is that all too often in a movie like this, Rami's character will meet Denzel, they'll be mad at each other, they'll be fighting and all of a sudden something happens where they're best friends. And what I like about this script is that Rami just wants to solve cases. And if this guy can help me solve a case, He's my best friend. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's, th thanks for saying that. I, I appreciate that too, that it's a, it's a slow burn between them, you know, a, a cop just 
relying on a, a you know or another cop to the point where they're joined at the hip and hopefully it happens incrementally so that all of a sudden you realize that in a say in some way Denzel's virus pardon the pun has passed to Rami and it sneaks up on you hopefully yeah hundred uh, percent is it a little nice though with it's coming out on HBO Max in America you know, the same day it's going to be in select theaters. Is it nice to not have to worry about the opening weekend box office? I guess in, 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 in some ways, yes, that's true. I mean, we all, you know, remember not so long ago when you get the call on Friday talking about the, the, the first screenings on the East Coast and then projecting what your domestic, uh, you know, gross would be for theaters um, and whether that was a thumbs up or a thumbs down and that dictated how much money was going to be spent selling the movie in the near future. And, you know, yeah, it's, 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 it's a little weird to work on something for two years and then have, you know, in, 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 one, in one set of screenings on the East Coast have, oh, this is what it is. Um, that said, it's a movie that has some scope and LA is a character. And I think it's, I mean, I think John Schwartzman did a beautiful job shooting it. Yeah. And, and we leaned heavily into uh, a palette that was different than my other movies. Um, and I don't know, I, it just it plays really, really well on a big screen. So I hope people that watch it on HBO Max will put it on the biggest screen possible they have in their homes. Well, listen, it goes without saying, I mean, I, I preach this all the time. There, no movie is going to be better at home. It's always going to be better watching it in a movie theater because you submerge. You know, you don't have your phone. You are in, you know, a completely different experience. Yeah. Um, shit, I miss the movie theater like you can't believe. Yeah, me too. You know, um, so I want to talk a little, I mean, there's a lot of things I want to talk about. Uh, and I wanted to talk about L.A., but I, I don't think I'm going to have the time. So I want to get into editing because... Okay. The editing of this movie is is important because you need to be dishing out information while not giving too much information. So talk a little bit about how you worked with your editor in crafting the tension. Yeah, um, uh, Rob Frazen uh, and I had worked together before and uh, have a good relationship with regard to that. But there were, <clears throat> excuse me, when I wrote the script, there were a list of things that would point to one conclusion and an equal number in another list that would point to a different conclusion so that people might, you know, actually have a valid argument about and be able to take a side. So you have to be careful about how you want to show everything, but how much do you show and how much do you give away? Is this too tight a shot of this clue? Uh, is this something that we like because it goes right by it? I, I think in some ways we were allowed, COVID was a good thing for us in that I had already finished shooting the movie and had kind of my first director's cut pretty much done by the time we got shut down. So I was able to do another cut of the movie and send it out to filmmaker friends and then to get their notes and do another one and another one because the world was upside down and we were all waiting. So Rob and I would work now, you know, albeit remotely, which is not ideal, but getting a, being able to do a bunch of different versions and getting closer, closer, closer and giving Rob time to really do some fine cutting in there and look for behavior and look for eye blinks and things that we liked. Um, but, but, but yeah, I mean, it was, so that, 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 that part was great. Also, what was probably good for this movie was we didn't have a preview. We didn't have a test screening, which is usually what comes out of that is, you know, you've got a, a third of the people say, I didn't get that. And you go, well, the other two thirds did. And it's important for me not to try to placate you because you were looking at your phone or something, you know, or went to the restroom. Um, but test screenings do have that for, you know, for a movie like this, that's trying to be smart. They're always going to play to the back of the audience. And I get that it's a, it's a business and, and all that. But I think we probably benefited from having no test screening. Did you have a much longer cut of this film that you almost released? Or was it always about 210? Well, I mean, like every single movie that's ever been made, your, you know, your initial assembly is everything. Sure. And, you know, and it's, and it's way long. And then we got pretty quickly got to, I don't know, I, two hours and 17 minutes, which is, then it's easy. The more you know about your movie, you know, you go, I'm, it, I'm taking, I want to take this out, but it's not because of time because I don't have any problem with the movie being 217 if that's the perfect length for it. But just as you learn more about your movie and keep doing this, doing this, doing this, we, I never felt like we cut for time. I felt like we cut for 
we've been here a long time now and I feel like something needs to happen. Let's jump cut this. We also, you know, we just from a stylistic standpoint, we're jump cutting a lot, not like a music video jump cut, but just trying to stay really electric with these guys trying to trying to solve these things and what they're seeing, what they're doing. Um, and just up cutting it a little bit, which I think kind of keeps you involved. So yes, was there a longer version? Yes. Is it a better version? No. Got it. Uh, I want to ask you a spoiler question, which I give you my word would not run till the movie is completely out. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, and so if you want to discuss, but I am curious if you, if you don't mind talking a little bit about the very end and how you came up with that ending and was it almost something else? Or was that always what you were driving towards? I, it, it was always what I was driving towards and I wanted it to be, I mean, I wanted it to be unexpected and I wanted it to be something that's almost Old Testament. I didn't want it to be, uh, you know, guns firing and this and that and all that. I wanted it to be unexpected and Old Testament. I'll say that. Sure, because the thing, one of the reasons I really dig the ending is it's not what your typical Hollywood ending is, you know, and I, I've seen that ending a thousand times. I have no interest in that ending. Yeah. I'm interested in what this movie does because it's something I have not seen before. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess on the one hand, you, you write it when you're you know, a young writer and, 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 every, and people read it and they love it um, and are responding to it, but it doesn't get made because it's not that form. Well, this is what people expect. I mean, there were, there were I mean, I can't tell you how many times um, studios would say, change you, if you change the ending we'll make this movie make it so we're absolutely positive who the good guy and who the bad guy is and we'll make this movie and i said that's the whole reason i wrote it why would i want to make that movie one of the things i think is great about streaming is that and it's already done it but it's allowed movies to be made that are not four quadrant films you know a lot of people are making one quadrant movies that are aiming at a very specific audience and genre uh, obviously not for like a $200 million budget, but it allows these movies to be made. Is, are you currently writing or developing anything like that? Stuff that you can only make now because of maybe the freedom that comes with streaming. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, I do adult dramas and it's kind of, you know, those are hard. They're hard to get, hard to get made. Um, so uh, when The Highwaymen that I've been attached to for, excuse me, 15 years, um, when Netflix and Scott Stuber expressed interest in it, that was a perfect place for that movie because Universal owned it and loved it. They just couldn't find a way to make it work for them in, in probably multiple quadrants. And I get that. But Netflix was a perfect place. We could come in and make that movie that I really wanted to make. And it didn't have to, it didn't have to survive in a box office and, and, and rely on 15 year old boys necessarily to, to sell the movie, you know? Um, I'm, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm adapting to direct a, a Stephen King novella, which is m kind of more like a, a Stand By Me than uh, Misery or something, or It. You know, it's 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 kind of a more of a character based thing, and it's smaller. And so I think that's that Netflix is the right place for that too. Can you say what that one is or no? Yeah, it's called uh, Mr. Harrigan's Phone, and it's from the uh, the book uh, If It Bleeds. Got it. I, I could ask you a million other questions, but I already got to go. I'm just going to say congrats on this. I also really enjoyed High Women. I hope oh. you're making another movie soon. Hey, me too. Me too. Good to see you. Let's not make it seven years. Hopefully not. Have a great day.